What exactly is the spirit of Jezebel? What does it mean? What does it look like? And why doesn't anybody want it? I think the first step in answering all of these questions is by asking, who was Jezebel? In 1 Kings chapter 16, the Bible paints a picture for us. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. From this passage, we learn several things about Jezebel, with the main one being that she was a worshipper of the Canaanite god of rain and fertility, Baal. She was an idol worshipper. Now, here's what you need to know about what kind of woman Jezebel was. The Bible says in 1 Kings 18, verse 4, For so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. This passage tells us that Jezebel killed many prophets of Jehovah in large-scale persecution. And don't just gloss over that. This wasn't a woman who was unfriendly or just mean. She was driven to hunt and destroy God's prophets. Now you don't go against the work of the Lord with such intensity and such ferocity unless, unless you are driven by an evil spirit, a spirit that seeks to destroy the things of God. Something that works in opposition is only from the devil. And so it is clear that this woman was used of the devil. Now, after Elijah proved Jehovah's superiority against Baal on Mount Carmel, Jezebel sought to kill Elijah. The Bible goes on to say in 1 Kings 19, verses 1 and 2, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And so I would like to explain what the spirit of Jezebel is. Its main objective is to destroy, to destroy the work of God, to destroy the man of God and the woman of God. It's a spirit that is of a tempter, a seducer, one that lures people away from God with the intention of destroying their faith, their hope, joy, and peace. Perhaps you have known a person like this in your life, someone who is always seducing and leading others into trouble. Now, be wise. Don't automatically think or relate seduction simply to sex. Money can seduce. People do crazy things for money. The thought of fame, the opportunity for fame, can be seductive to some. Lord knows people are willing to do crazy and unspeakable things, all to become famous. And that is the infestation of the Jezebel spirit of narcissistic manipulation and subversion in the lives of a growing number of people. And its traits can sometimes be found also in men. But this spirit, according to the Bible, is more common in women and we can hardly be surprised at its increase due to the huge amount of propaganda that encourages this type of behavior These trends in our modern day society are leading towards the ultimate agenda of the demasculinization of men whilst nurturing a false and counterfeit masculinity in women. The traditional male is being shunned. 
whilst propaganda to enable this type of behaviour in women within the realm of the Jezebel spirit and its traits is being pushed. The way that I controlled Karen was just force of my personality. I, I had a stronger personality than she had. The other thing is I'm a fast talker, I'm a fast thinker. That's not always good. Uh, sometimes I talk in front of my brain and that's not a good thing. Karen doesn't process information as quickly um, and she can't speak as quickly as I can. So early in our marriage when we would have a fight, I would just overpower her with the force of my personality and the force of my language and, and things like that. And so some people, they just, they wear you out. If they don't get their way, they'll just wear you out. And you know, another way that you know being, you're being controlled is you're going to pay a price if you don't go along. That's the way people control others. You can, you can come against me, but you're going to pay a price. I'm going to train you. So that's, that's how people control. Why does God curse control? We're going to talk about breaking the curse of control. Why does God curse control? The first reason is anyone we control, we've taken God's place in their lives. If, if I'm controlling another person, I'm not talking about righteous authority now, but if I'm controlling another person, I have taken the position of Jesus Christ in that person's life. But believing somehow, I guess I have a divine right to do that, but we don't. Only God has the right to control. But, but I wanna tell you something about the nature of God, and that is God is not a controller. You, you'll never wake up in the morning with the Lord standing at your bed going, now get up and pray right now. Now you get up right now, you man of God, you woman of God, and you pray and you read your Bible and you, he doesn't do that. He could, but he doesn't do that. Let me tell you something about the Lord. He's a shepherd, not a sheep herder. A shepherd stands in front of the sheep and leads the willing. A sheep herder gets behind the sheep and drives them against their will. God doesn't control us against our will. He gives us the opportunity to do what we want to do without being controlled. Now there will be an end of the age of grace. And then according to our will, we go to heaven or against some, our will, some people will go to hell. There will be a time that God imposes his will, but all he's doing at that point is just honoring what people decided. But God is not a controller. And so that, it's against his nature. And whenever we're controlling, we're taking his place. The other thing about control is it prevents trust and intimacy. Karen and I, when I was controlling our relationship, we had no intimacy whatsoever. You, you can't. Uh, University of California, did a study, a very intense study years ago of uh, marriage and control. And they took 130 newly married couples and they tracked them for five years. And what they were trying to find was, what is the secret of a happy marriage? And so they, they interviewed these couples over a period of five years. And at the same time that they were studying the 130 couples, they had another group of couples that had been married for a while and they were also studying them. At the end of the study, they decided the number one factor that creates the goodwill and happiness of marriage is shared control of the relationship. And they found if one person controls the other, the intimacy and satisfaction of the marriage drops dramatically. You simply can't be intimate with someone who's controlling you because it, it violates us. We know it's wrong. Jesus would have wanted you to love all of us. Oh, I do. That's why I preach. You don't. You don't. Oh, why do you feel? Do you know my heart? Do you know my heart? I do not know your heart. How do you know I don't love these people? You, because you're telling us you don't love what them. What did I say? Whoa. You're telling us to change. And we don't need Yes, to change. Stop wow. Stop living because in death, okay. death lifestyles okay. and come to Jesus. There's you're not okay. Wrong with us. You're not okay. All of these nothing people. wrong with us? Wrong Are you serious? So, 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 so do, do, you, do you see people, do kids getting raped today? Yeah. Is that, is that right or wrong? No, no, answer the question. Is that right or wrong? Well, well, let me have a voice. Is it right or wrong? Let me have a voice. I'm asking you a question. That's your voice. Is it right or wrong? You know, and I know. Is it okay? Yes or no? Go ahead. Right, right or wrong? Raping children is not right. So that means there is problems in this world and somebody needs to hear a preacher. Is, is, are people murdering people today? Yeah. That's something wrong. Do people steal things today? Yeah. Do people cheat on their husbands and wives today? So look how much we agree on. Okay, so there is, you just told me in your own words we that we, on. I'm calling people to change. Yes, I am calling people to, I'm preaching hate. What did I, what did I say? 
When you're telling people that they cannot live in this society... No, you can. No. Well, you're telling me it's wrong. It is. The way I'm living, it is not I don't know how you're... First of all, I don't know how you're living. How are you living? I'm living well. I'm a good but, but who are you? I mean, I don't know you to know what you're living right and wrong. But there is... You, you just decide. agreed no, that are people are living decide. wrong. Who am I to decide? Yeah, who are you I'm the guy decide? that preaches the word of God, yeah, and he's and the, the one who decides. Word of God is, and you're very angry. We are the word of God, right here. You're not the word of God unless you're living by the word of God. You're not the word of God. Jesus is. Jesus is the living word of God. And he preached the word. And he said, repent, and he said, which, is, which means change. Amen. Do you know what Jesus' first words were? Exactly. Do you know what Jesus' first words are since you know Jesus so much? You know what his first words are? Tell us no, you tell you me. Know you, know, you tell me. You know everything. You came here telling me Jesus wouldn't say this. And you said, I'm preaching for people to change. Did you not say that? Did you not say that? Jesus loved everybody. Did you not say that I'm preaching for people to change? Well, that, aren't you? I am. And that's what you said. So did Jesus preach for people to change? Yeah. Sure. So the people So so them. what's the problem with so, my preaching? So why do you keep pulling this away from me? Because I need to talk and you need to you talk. Because you don't want to hear me. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna let you speak. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Give it no, let me hold it. I'm gonna hold it. Well then I'm not speaking because you're gonna It's okay. Away. I didn't even want you to speak to begin with. Well, I mean you came in here interrupted. No, you I don't want to hear what I wanna hear you. I wanna hear you. Go. No, you don't. Okay. You wanna pre I gave you the mic. The mic's right in your mouth. Say what you gotta say. I am angry. I'll tell you why I'm angry. Because we, hey, it's my turn, okay? No, Jesus is like only half. It's it, look. Look. Let me just let me say something. Look around. Well, that's the problem right there. Well, the no, say what you gotta say. Wait. The no, I'm listening to you. Well, stop pulling it away from me. You know what the liberal garbage is? The right to, for you to stand here and for this gentleman to stand here and say something. It's the freedom of the press. It's the freedom. Why are you telling me can't? I'm, yeah, exactly. Because I'm upset about what he's but saying. He but you don't have to me. But, yeah. that, but if you're upset with what I'm saying, aren't you kind of contradicting yourself since you're telling me that this liberal lifestyle is for is is freedom for me too? Because Jesus Christ is very narrow. His way is very narrow. Jesus said. Okay, so, so do you, I don't, I'm not looking at it, but so why do you glory in your shame? Why do you find it very, uh, glory in my shame. well, yeah, the Bible says they glory in their shame, the sinners. Really? Yeah. You find it amusing and entertaining, I do. but you're not weighing the balance, ma'am. Have you ever been high? Can you, yes. Too high. Yes. Oh my God, you pot? Yeah. I used yeah. to be on this list. I used to be a pot smoker, but I repented. I asked God for forgiveness and I changed my ways. Did you reply? Yes. He didn't do so you talk to yeah. God? The Bible says repentance brings refreshing. After I confessed my sins, I felt light as a feather. He forgave me of my sins, clean my slate. How do you know he forgave you? Because the Bible says, whosoever, Bible. whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I called upon his name and he saved me. Uh, holy men of God who are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Men, so men wrote the, the apostles of Jesus so Christ, the Paul, Peter, so what men are you to do. the Holy Spirit is God, ma'am. The Holy Spirit? They were under the possession of the Holy Spirit. Oh, they were probably high. Okay, don't blaspheme, don't blaspheme the Spirit. The Bible says all sins shall be forgiven, but whoever speaks a word against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven in this, this life nor in the next. God loves everyone, that's why he gave us his son, but you're commanded to repent. Not everyone's going to go to heaven, ma'am. Who's going to go to hell? You? No, okay, I'm asking you, logically speaking, who, go, who is going to go to hell? Who deserves hell? You don't, think a, you don't think a pedophile deserves hell who never repented? You don't think a murderer deserves hell who never repented? When you die, you die. That's when you die, you die, that's it? Well, that's according to a myth. Or, or maybe you could be like Judas, like you get reborn. Like there's all these different possibilities. And who are you yeah. to tell people what they can believe? Well, I believe the Bible, ma'am. If okay, you want, that's good. That's you want to believe the Quran, be, believe the Quran. Everyone put their chips on the side because Judgment Day is coming. Okay, put your chips on the side that you believe in. I put my chips on the side of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. You can believe what you want to believe, but who are you to tell people what they can My Bible tells me to go out and preach the gospel to all creatures. I'm commanded to do this. Well, don't do this fucking God's world. I've done, I've done preaching, uh, you know, in other places. Uh, that's a distractor. She's trying to just draw you away from Jesus. Okay, so yes, we have the obligation to preach. Okay? No, they could, they have a right to stay. Why, why are you trying to block the gospel, ma'am? How to innocently seduce him.
These are some good and effective tips, so I'm going to need y'all to really pay attention. If you're shy, I got a way to do this. And if you're a little more bold, I got a way for you too. Today is all about your straw. <laughs> y'all going to be like, what that even mean? I'm going to show you right now. Next time you with him and you got to drink, your eyes dinner, whatever, get a straw, okay? And for the shy girls, what I need you to do is every time you go to get a sip, look away. This is going to really allow him to focus on your lips. Every time you get a drink of that straw and he facing you, he going to look at your lips, baby. He going to stare at your lips. Now, for the girls who are a little more bold, I'm going to need you to make eye contact. And it's going to look like this. So when he's talking to you, he don't even got to be talking to you. Just make sure that you can get his attention. Like, he looking at you, right? And when you got him looking at you, this is what I need you to do. This the straw sounds for me. But anyway, that's a very innocent way to seduce him. It's going to work. You're welcome. Quiet, no words. Well, ladies, it's a very simple method to be able to seduce, allure, attract, to have a man in the palms of your fingers just by being you without words. So how to seduce a man without saying a word? The first thing we have to know, when we're talking to a man, 60% of what you say is all nonverbal. So what does that mean? That means 60% of what a man perceives, what he gathers from the conversation you've had with him is not what you've said. So that means what we're saying is irrelevant to most men. They're not caring, they're not making a judgment if they want us, if they're attracted to us, if they're seduced by us, by what we say, if by what we do. So this is very important for us to know because it is the key to realizing that we have to up our game with our non-verbal cues. We're going to have to get really good at body language. Our body language is the key. A lot of people say that seduction is a form of manipulation, which to a certain extent it is. So if you're one of those people who morally can't seduce someone, you should still watch this video because you can be one step ahead and notice when someone is trying to seduce you. One of the things that I believe that makes a woman a great seducer is a woman who knows herself. You know, she knows what is beautiful about her. For me, I know that I have beautiful eyes and I think that my breasts are beautiful and a lot of men are attracted to my voice. So me knowing that I utilize those features about myself to seduce the person that I'm trying to seduce. Of course, we're not in a perfect world and everybody is not gonna be for everybody. You must remember when it comes to the art of seduction is making sure that you're seducing the right person. You